6th. I'm David Dorian Ross, and this is the Virtual Pipe Club meeting. Um, and these are the beautiful people from the Virtual Pipe Club. Say good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good, morning. good afternoon. Morning. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. There we go. Good afternoon. I don't know if I ever told you guys this story. I, I had a girlfriend in college who went to work in a call center, and, you know, they didn't really give her a lot of training, but they had the script right above her, like, tacked onto her cubicle there. And it always it started out, you answer the phone and say, G, uh, G-M-G-A-G-E. And so for the first, like, three weeks, she was going, uh, Gim Gagi, like, this is the, you know, the company slogan or something like that. Finally, her coworker leaned over and goes, it means good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> so, Gim Gagi, uh, <laughs> to say welcome to everybody. Uh, I want to say hello to the people over there on, um, oh, S Steph and Skip are over there already. Um, on uh, Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, and for those of you who are watching over there on YouTube or who sneak in in a few minutes over there on YouTube and start from the beginning, here's my first question to you. Are you subscribed yet? Uh, well, get on it. Get busy. Subscribe to the channel there. And if you're watching over there on Facebook and, and or if you do Facebook and you're not, you know, signed up on the Facebook uh, group page, I would recommend you do that because we have some special things coming up, like a like we just did a special club pipe, and we have a special club blend coming up, and we've got some additional surprises, which Oliver and I are going to talk about next weekend. Um, but you can only do that if you're a member uh, on the Facebook page, because it's not like you have to pay any dues or anything. Speaking of which, is Simon here yet? He usually comes in later. I just want to share with you that today I am an official member of the Pipe Club of London. Oh, wow. Just, I feel so special. And so this is what we're missing. We're, we're missing stickers and lapel pins. So I think now that we have the logo, we're going to go do that. Um, anyway, all that is um, neither here nor there. Uh, just want to say good morning to everybody. Uh, when you're watching over there on YouTube and you've got questions for our special guest, um, just go ahead and type it in there and I will pass it along to them. That's all I want to say. Now I'm going to get my big ugly mug off the screen here so that we can chat with everybody and talk about what we're smoking and what we're smoking it in. And Oliver, would you yes. sort of lead that off there? Because when I put it on speaker view and then talk, it does that thing. All right. So I'm smoking today Mac Barron's Latakia Flake in, in uh, what is that? This is the uh, Stanville. It, it's called Black and White. It's a uh, shape of 400, whatever it is. And the funny thing is, I have a second stamp for that. So this is why Black and White. So it's... Yeah, not that fancy, but it's a good smoker. That is nice. Thank you. Oh, That's and before I forget, so I have a new pipe I have to show you. Most of the people know that. This is my, oh. this yeah, is a baby beautiful. from, yeah, oh, let's see. That and you see it, it's pretty much unsmoked. I, I have to figure out what day is the right day for this one. November. Look at the I think you need white gloves for that too, Oliver. Oh, I have some. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful pipe. Thank you. Very, Thank you. very. So I figured out they made, they made only 40 of them. So and that's, that's interesting, I guess. Who's next? Yeah, Oliver, um, I'm going to let you sort of uh, be the moderator of, of our pipe go around here so that I don't have to talk. All right, that's good. David, mister, what you are smoking? I'm just smoking this. One of my favorites by you, Morning. And this Castello Rock. Wow. 
Mm-hmm. That's one of my dreams. The Costello Zero. Lucky you. That, that's a lot of our dreams. That's why they're so rare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peter Gitz, what's about you? New location, I see. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm not smoking today. I'm indoors. The the temperature is minus two Fahrenheit. And wow. it's the wind chill is minus 27 or something right now. And I can I can make that outbuilding warm if I want to burn a bunch of wood, but it's just like I don't want to burn all my wood in one day. So I'm in my uh my studio correcting calculus tests on my iPad. <laughs> and I just really looking forward to the meeting. So thank you for checking Perfect. in with me. <laughs> Sunbear John, what's going on? How much Oliver? Uh smoking the uh carbon home with some uh cabbies mixture. Very cool. Love the cabbies. <laughs> Tim Heineck. What's yes. Up? Hey everybody, I am smoking. Uh, from in, in honor of our guest today, I am smoking a Cambridge Flake in an LJ Peretti straight grain <clears throat> pipe that I bought from Robert Peretti maybe 30 years ago in uh, Peretti's store. And it's a beautiful pipe with some beautiful grain. Wow. And it's a nice combination of things. So I'm really happy that Steve is here today to talk with us about LJ Peretti's very storied uh, tobacco shop in Boston, Mass. Very excited. Stephen, what's going on, on on your side? I'm smoking some of David's Bayou Morning in my uh, newly acquired golf ball, Mirsham golf ball, that uh, I saw Phil smoking one day and contacted him to find out where to get it. And I got it. How many different bowls do you have for that pipe? Three. Okay. Well, I have two stems, but I have three bowls. Okay. Where did you say you got the golf ball? Uh, CPW. Okay. Over in Turkey. They, uh, on the website, it said that you did it in like nine days. It, it took 31 more than that, but it did come here. <laughs> I think they put it on a canoe instead of a boat. <laughs> but it's really very, very nice. It smoked good. The only thing that is kind of weird is that as it's coloring, it looks more pink than yellow. Hmm. So now, is it is it pretty much the size of a golf ball, or is it a little bigger? It looks like no, it's a bit bigger. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how they did that, though. It's pretty good. Well, I was just looking for that last night. That's funny that you brought it out today. Thank you. There's also one on uh, eBay that I saw that I guess the guy bought it from Ford Noggins or somebody and I guess he's getting rid of it. It's already colored pretty good. And I think he wanted $50 for it. It was on oh, eBay. Really? Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't Falcon make one of their own uh, like that for, uh, the, like in the golf ball shape? I didn't they see only it. do briars, don't they? No, they have some, yeah, maybe so. I, they have a Meerschaum lined one that they do. But I don't right. know that they do a, a, a full marathon. Yeah. But it's, it smokes great. And it's also, it's a, it's a really big bowl, too, which is nice. Yeah, you said CPW? Yeah, Calabash Pipe World. Okay. You know, yeah, we, we do have a store owner with us today. It wouldn't be bad to ask if he sells them or if he has a line oh, on them. Yeah. So, yeah. When we get there, hold on to that thought. <laughs> well, well, Ed and I are smoking a little uh, salty dog from Dan's. Has anybody ever had that before? No, I love it. It's delicious to tobacco. It is. We're we're just yeah. trying it the first time. It uh, burns, burns, burns really slow. Mm-hmm. 
Jürgen, what are you smoking? I have early day today. So I smoked the Amphora Burley and after that, uh, the Makuva, which is also a Burley based uh, Virginia Paris Burley blend uh, from HU. That's very appropriate. Um, for those of you who don't know, Burley was the early specialty of Bob Peretti. So um, if I should have brought more Burley, <laughs> but uh, that's that's very much in line with what we got in the in the house today. Um, speaking of which, I'll just go real quick here. I've got uh, a 2006 can of what I didn't realize until I started reading as apparently the last entry in the Peretti blend books, D9575. Steve says, Steve says no. He says, like, that's, not, this, that's what's on your website. I'm, um, I was going to ask him if, if, um, if I know the number, if he can tell me what's in it. Um, but I brought that especially for, for being today. Um, well, I'll tell you what. It all sounds very delicious. Um, I want to introduce our guest today. And for those people who are watching over there on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, today is uh, really exciting for us uh, because we had this idea that in 2021, we would go a little bit farther than we did last year in 2020, where we had so many wonderful special guests who talked about everything from pipe carving to tobacco blending in some parts of the business, et cetera. Um, and I thought one of the places that we could go is actually see if we could virtually go into the, the famous and favorite brick and mortar pipe clubs, pipe, pipe shops and tobacconists that are still in business. And um, I've been soliciting suggestions mm -hmm. of, well, of who that might be. And Tim Heineck, who um, is the head of the Sherlock Holmes Pipe Club there in, in nearby yeah, Boston, same. Massachusetts, recommended Steve Willett over there to LJ Peretti. And I think that was a perfect, perfect place to start off with. Uh, LJ Peretti is like one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, I have to I keep getting that juggled up here, but certainly in New England and certainly in Boston and certainly in, in the United States, 1870 is when the, uh, when the shop opened up. And I'm going to let our guest talk about that, the proprietor and current master blender, uh, Steve Willett. And I just want to say, Steve, welcome. And um, I'm going to put you on spotlight and just say a few words to, uh, to the group about who you are and and uh, we'll start from there. Yeah, but you're on, but Steve, you're on mute, so I have to get you unmuted. There we go. Well, thank you for having Steve, me. Steve, apparently, ha by the way, so fancy, he has a, he has a producer in-house that is doing all the work for him. Because I don't do any work. I just supervise. <laughs> but uh, I want you to, I want to thank you all for having us on. Uh, it's an honor to be included in your forum, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions you have. As you may or may not know, the <coughs> second oldest tobacco in the United States. I think Ivan Reese predates us by two years, mm -hmm. but we're certainly the oldest tobacconist that still blends their own tobacco by hand and makes pipes and does repairs in house. So it's a somewhat of a distinction. And uh, we started in 1870, actually, as the L.J. Peretti Company, Cuban Cigar Company. And we still own the, the trademarks, and we made a number of clear Havana cigars and other cigars with Havana tobacco in them. Not about 400 yards from the present store, we had a large factory there where we had 80 rollers. But then Social Security came along, and that ruined that phase of the business because the company was housing them, feeding them, et cetera, and it became prohibitively expensive. And so gradually, and of course, cigar smoking was much larger than pipe smoking at that time in the United States. So the company transitioned. They'd always made a few pipe tobaccos, but they transitioned to pipe tobacco over the years, especially with my former partner, Bob Peretti. His father, the major, had made some pipe tobaccos like our British and Cuban and original, but Bob Reddy was really 
really the, the genius behind blending pipe tobacco. I mean, he was acknowledged for many years as the foremost blender in the United States. You know, you know, with along with the people at that time like Milton Sherman and the people who worked with Matt Sherman and uh, Herman Lane. I mean, they were all friends, and they they were all in this very room where we are now, the blending room, and all blended tobacco together. And then uh, over the years, after I I worked here in graduate school, and then I taught and uh, ran my father's business for a while and sold it. I decided to come back and work on my hobbies. So here we are. That's essentially the the brief history of my tenure here, anyway. So, um, Steve, when you say you after graduate school you came to work, where, had you been working in the shop before that? Had you been a pipe smoker I before in the that? Shop when I was in graduate school, yeah, part time. And then I was in New Haven, and I used to live here, and I actually used to come up and work here when I was in graduate. How did that start? Did you just wander into the shop one day with a help wanted sign and or no, no, no. I'd been interested in pipe tobacco when I was an undergraduate in Boston, and I'd gone here. I'd gone to Ehrlich's, and I uh, sort of liked the vibe here better and the tobacco better. And uh, I just gravitated to the store, and I got to know Bob Peretti and the other people who worked here. And a part time job came up, and I said, sure. And again, it's like work, working at your hobby is not a bad thing. Right. So was there a, like a progression? Did you start out in the stock room and then some, one day you wandered into the blending room and, uh, no, I started out, I started out in, in the front of the school waiting on customers and learning the business kind of from the ground up. I mean, I washed the floor, I did everything. And, uh, because who was I, I was, you know, some punk in graduate school, but, uh, you know, my job, the only job I had with tobacco was I had to pack it. I can remember standing at this bench all day and packing tobacco. But again, it wasn't the worst thing to do. It was better than uh, digging ditches. So, and I enjoyed it and I, I could smoke as much as I wanted. So that's how I, I started here. And then uh, I knew, you know, I knew something about tobacco from the, from the time I was here. And then I, when I actually came back, let's, I think in the early eighties or late middle eighties, uh, I came back with a proviso that I would take stock, some stock and some salary rather than all salary. And that's when I essentially learned the business. Bob wanted his, his son had left the business years ago and he wanted someone to carry on. And so that one I really learned about blending and the, the finer points of tobacco. So, you know, it's an ongoing process. I don't claim to know everything about tobacco. I know a little bit, but uh, the longer you do it, the more you can understand the nature of tobacco and what each tobacco can do. And we like to think that with this, well, with the old formulas we have and the formulas we constantly evolve, we can pretty much satisfy everyone. I'm curious about, you know, because of the fact that you had um, lots of old formulas dating all the way back to the teens and whatnot. When you were learning blending, did you just sort of start from where you guys were in the 80s, or did you go back into some of the early blending books and try to figure out how that was made? Well, the way it works, essentially, is there are two blending books. There's a regular blending book, which has, which has the formulas of the tobaccos, about 90 tobaccos we make all the time. Back here and downstairs, there are pounds and half pounds. And there are about 90 blends, 85 to 90, we make all the time. But there's over 250,000 private blends. In fact, they go back earlier than that. They go back to about 1880. But I have one of the books, I'll have Nate show you later on the bench, which just happens to be open to the page of the Prime Minister of Great Britain, who was here in 1933, Ramsey McDonald. But the old books are in the safe because they're old and I don't want them to totally decompose. Now, I can't make all the blends in the books. I've made some, we make, can make a lot of them, but some of the tobaccos that we use are just non-existent anymore. Some of the tobaccos we get from England or Ireland or places like that, something called Blue Jay. I mean, I'm really going back now. Things like that you just can't get anymore. But most of the tobaccos we can duplicate still. But a lot of them are, belong to people. Someone likes a tobacco. In fact, I'm making three different ones now for three different people in California. We send them samples, they send them back. It could take two, three, four months because they arrive at a blend, we assign them a number and it's theirs for life. 
and that's part of the lore of Paredes. You have that on the tobacco cans, there's a space where it says number and your name, and when you get a name and a number, you're kind of in the inner circle. Wow. So what are the, um, the blends you make all the time then? Well, they're on the website. I mean, we make flakes, we make Cavendishes, we make Burley blends, and we make English blends. So we cover the whole spectrum. And I mean, we could make a lot more, but my, I like to have no two blends that are even a bit similar. I think that every tobacco blend that a company puts out should be distinct and stand on its own. So I mean, I could go tomorrow to 200 blends, like some companies will put them on their website, but I don't see the point in that. I would rather have someone tell me, I like British blend, but I, I'd like a little more Perique in it, or I like Oriental number 40, but could substitute some Turkish number one for the Imidji. Work that out, because that to me is how an individual gets a blend he truly likes, rather than just flooding the market with blends. I know a lot of my competitors wouldn't agree with me, but it's much more of a personal thing here. Um, so of the uh, sort of over-the-counter blends, then do you, I mean, it sounds to me like you, you've identified which are the, 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 the narrow um, flavors that you want to sell, but is there one that you would say is more popular than others or, or even how has that changed over the years? You got to understand they're not over the counter blends. Every day they get blended here. I mean, they're, they're you can only buy them here. They're they are unique blends. But I mean, within each group, there are certainly popular. I mean, like we probably have 25, 30 English blends. I would say right now, Royal and Omega might be the two most popular, but they might not. They come in spurts. Mm -hmm. and then some gentleman will call up and order. You know, like the other day in the in the Burleys, a guy just called up and ordered. I don't know, six or eight pounds of Irish mist, which hasn't particularly been selling well lately, but it's part of our repertoire and they, they you know, they're, they're out there and then they want to smoke it. Uh, so, I mean, if you say Cavendish would make one that's 432, that's very popular, for example. And that was actually a tobacco that was developed with Mr. Peretti, Bob Peretti and Herman Lane after Herman came out with Captain Black. You know what Captain Black did to the Cavendish business. There were essentially no Cavendish. Before Herman Lane, the Cavendish is what it was traditionally, just a cut of tobacco. He turned it into a flavored, springy cut of aromatic tobacco. So, I mean, there are certainly blends like that. I mean, the Burleys is really no, we sell so much Burley, there's really no singular one that's the most popular. Uh, I'm smoking 101, for example, which is one of our older blends, but there's really no rhyme or reason. It depends, depends on the season, who orders, I mean, probably the most popular, if I can make it all year, is our Thanksgiving Day blend, but I only make it once a year because we press it, and it's a lot of work. And I think last year we pressed it in four-ounce cakes. I think we made, I don't know, four or 500 cakes last year. And I started in August making it, so, you know. So that's what I mean. And you say you're, you're smoking 101 right now. Is that is that a favorite of yours, or is it just is that hand and you picked it up? No, no, everything's at hand. I just, uh, <clears throat> I smoke 101 because it's a, a deep, rich, burly, and it's slight, just very slightly sweet, not in the Cavendish sense of sweet, but in the sense of, of burleys have a, have a deep taste in the, from the tobacco. So deep, in fact, that if a burley is blended properly, we like to say this about all our tobaccos, when you finish a bowl, there's a little bit of something in your palate that says, you know, I'd like to have another bowl whether you like it, whether you want to have it now or not. Much like, you know, if you have a scotch, you have one, you say, maybe I'll have one more. <laughs> and that's what a true, but that's what a true tobacconist should want for his tobacco, that there's a desire to come back to it. Yeah, I've noticed uh, high quality, well-aged burly has kind of uh, maple syrup sweetness. Well, as you know, burley, unlike Virginia, low in sugar content. So Burley has to have something added to it. Uh, you could add maple syrup, you could order liquor. I mean, uh, Edgeworth was famous for licorice. Yeah, no, uh, Burley, yes. Burley usually has some casing, but uh, like high quality Burley usually has like uh, just a little bit of added sugar and uh, right. 
uh, in combination with that uh, native, uh, natural native flavor of Burley, exactly. it's kind of like maple syrup sweetness. Well, I like more of the licorice taste, but I know what you mean. But the point is, the Burley itself, there's a lot of Burley, but there's a lot of crap in Burley. You have to have a good cube, in my opinion, a fairly large cube cut, not large, but dense cube cut Burley that burns slow. The aromatic take, takes to that much easier. If you don't do that, you just put a superficial top dressing on the Burley, it doesn't taste right and it evaporates. So I quite agree with you. There should be a deep taste to the Burley. Yeah, actually for many years, I thought uh, that smoking Burley is no better than smoking uh, peanut shells until I tried Salani aged Burley flake. And then I started to appreciate a uh, real taste of Burley. <laughs> and now I use it in some of my blends as well. <laughs> right. No, I agree. In fact, uh, a wise man once told me that sooner or later, everybody ends up smoking Burley because you can do so much with Burley that you can't do with Virginia's or Oriental. But it's an evolution, you know? That's what I was I um, saying. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Dimitri. I was uh, talking uh, with uh, Mr. Sherman, Joel Sherman. Uh, he's also a pipe smoker, as you know, and uh, he, uh, his favorite are uh, Orientals, and he did smoke some of the rich tobaccos, and uh, uh, I got uh, great feedback from him. He uh, loved uh, the rich tobaccos. <laughs> so, Joel Sherman. He's still alive. He's a good friend of mine. He's, he's a wonderful man. You're quite right. Yes, I know he's alive, and uh, I no, met he's not him doing back well. when uh, Nat Sherman right. was owned by family. I had pleasure of meeting him on many occasions. Know all his children very well. Actually, Michelle, um, you know Michelle too, then. Yeah. Of course, I know Michelle. Yeah, Missy. she's a sweetheart. She's yes, and your husband, very great guy. Right, artist. very good artist. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> Bill and Larry. Larry right. is. Uh, actually helped me uh, a lot uh, to increase my knowledge about Nat Sherman pipes. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I have second largest collection of Nat Sherman pipes. I have about 30 of them. I know Larry has more. <laughs> well, you should have met the grandfather. You had a real character on your hands. Yeah, Man. well, uh, actually, I came to New York uh, after his death. He, uh, right. Yeah. But uh, I've been regular at Nat Sherman since 1993, and oh, basically until its last days. <laughs> yeah, it's a great loss to the tobacco business that they're not there anymore. Well, uh, uh, on the positive side, uh, Michael Shortlot and know, uh, Brandon Scott, uh, they acquired the, the cigar, uh, brand, yeah. cigar brand, uh, which will be produced by Nat Sherman, and now they will be produced again under uh, Sergio Chego. Right. So this is a, a good moment, I think, um, before we get a little bit deeper into some of Steve's stories for the group to ask any other questions that you might have. So, Steve, this is what I do from time to time. I just pause and because I, I can hear it. I can hear your thoughts, guys. <laughs> so if you've got some questions for Steve, um, just throw them out there. You'll notice that I have put many of you on mute. That's only to so that it doesn't uh, take over Zoom, but you can put your mics back on anytime you want to just yell out a question for Steve. And that goes for you guys over there on YouTube as well. Just type your questions into the chat. I've got it right in front of me and I'll, I'll ask Steve for you. One of the questions I have is if the classification you have on your webpage, it's based on like the old way you classify everything because like, for example, the London flake, why don't you have these ones under vapors or orientals? And well, you put because, it like, like an English one. I think vapor is a useless classification that's come around in the last couple of years. I know it's popular, but you know, we're old school, old line. So I'm not about to change that. We keep the flakes separate because not all, not all flakes are vapor, first of all. Not all of our flakes have perique in it. And uh, so I like to classify it that way by the type of tobacco. But I mean, there's an 800 number on the website. People call. I mean, it's. But I just think that's the best way to classify them for us. You know, because we have so many tobacco. That, that's that's. It's nothing against. That this is the way I do it. Well, actually, yes, vapor I, tobaccos existed for many years, but most of the time they were sold just uh, like Virginia tobacco. Right. 
they had some period as a condiment, but right. basically they were just sold as Virginia's. Right. Right. Well, they're all Virginia based. I mean, you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to have a flake that it was Parik based. I mean, some guy I used to have a guy that worked for us who smoked straight Parik, but I mean, he is the exception to the rule. So obviously, I, I maybe I should make it more explicit that they're all Virginia based. That might help, except the Cambridge flake, which actually has more Latakia than Virginia. Steve, you had mentioned something about Edgeworth. And I wonder, do you have anything in your line that is uh, close to that? Well, we have a, our BPC, Burley Plug Cut. I mean, I'm not divulging a secret. If you have a, if you have a palate, you'll taste it. We use li licorice is in, in the Burley. And it's not cut the same way. It's a little bit, as I say, it's a chunky cube cut Burley. But you probably know the story about Edgeworth. This is not my story, but... Bob Peretti was at the Laris Brothers factory in Virginia in the 40s. And Edgeworth was such a popular tobacco. They had, it was all out on this big deck. And they would actually take fire hoses filled with licorice and spray the tobacco that way that they needed so much licorice to get on the tobacco. And of course, over the years, Edgeworth has kind of devolved in terms of, I mean, the Lane makes essentially makes a tobacco now under a different name than Edwards in a blue pin, but it's not the same tobacco. I like to think that the taste of ours is more like the Edgeworth slice, the old Edgeworth slice that came in a little blue can if you rubbed it out. Does it have the molasses and the cocoa in it? Well, I, I can't tell you everything, but it, it's a similar taste. What you really <laughs> taste in Edgeworth is the licorice. And I mean, there's no question. The old Edgeworth, I can't speak of the new one, but it's still there a little bit. Steve, there's a question that came up in the chat here uh, about your flakes. How long do you press those flakes for? Uh, well, depending on the flake, and I, I have more trouble with the ones with Latakia because they don't press as well. But we try to press them for about a month. But our presses, we use old manual presses here because we're cheap Yankees. And... Uh, so it's a very time consuming process, but they usually press for about a month. A couple of questions have come from the guys over there on YouTube. Um, first of all, one of the gentlemen wanted to, I'm just gonna scroll back here so I can find it, uh, to tell you that he is smoking a Costello that was previously owned by Charlie Norman. Yeah, Charlie worked for me for, me for a long time and he was, the largest collector of collector of high end Costellos in the world, and uh, mostly great line Fiamatas, if you know what those are. And uh, he was totally devoted to Costello. Some of his pipes are now in the Costello Museum in Cantu. We have a few of his pipes here, but they're not for sale. And his widow must have two or three hundred more in their house. So uh, yeah, in fact, Charlie kind of converted me from Dunhill to Costello. I just don't happen to be smoking. I got Costellos here, but I'm not smoking one at the moment. But I, I have 800 pipes, so I know what I want to smoke. <laughs> um, he also wanted to know, I told him I was going to ask this question in a slightly different way. Um, you guys aren't going anywhere anytime soon, are you? You know, No plans on moving the, no. the storefront? I think, I think no, he was... No, we've been in this location. This is not the original store. We had at one time there were four or five different stores in Boston and one in the suburbs. But this store has been here. We've been here since 1938, and I just signed another lease. <clears throat> gotcha. Good. I think that was that was the concern. No. Um, and then one other question, uh, and then I'll turn it back to our group in the Zoom room. Um, uh, and this is kind of a, an interesting question that we get asked a, a lot to pass on to our guests here. Uh, whether you've seen sales change over the last 10 years or so uh, in terms of, I don't know, volume type flavors, you know, palettes that people have, and, and where do you see it going in the next five years? Uh, well, in terms of volume, I would say like everybody in the tobacco business during last year, we're up because People are smoking more. In fact, suppliers of mine tell me that nationally pipe, uh, pipe tobacco sales are up about 20%. In 
terms of taste, we're also seeing a lot of younger smokers. So I don't know what most people do, but we try to start someone off on a milder blend so they don't get discouraged initially. So we, we saw a lot of uh, mild tobacco, but as your other guests said, we saw a lot of the vapor reefs. We saw a lot of matured Virginia. And, you know, we're famous for Burleys and English blends, so uh, that's that's held up very well. We saw a lot of that, too. I mean, I spend five or six hours a day in this room, so we must be selling a lot of tobacco. And where do I see it going? I see pipe smoking actually maintaining, if not increasing, because it's the least expensive, for no other reason, but forget the taste. It's the least expensive way to smoke, and uh, that's certainly a factor. So I see it as steady to up next five years see you just have to ask the right person so so many times we think about the uh, tobacco industry and premium tobacco in sort of uh, pessimistic ways what with federal regulations etc but I'm I all the research that I've got and all the reports that I've got I, I think Steve just confirms what I was thinking and and that is that I think we're actually going to see a renaissance of pipe smoking and it's going to it's going to get better. Um, any so, other questions you guys in the Zoom room have? Just, just open it up was, to Steve. Yeah, I was going to, so Steve, um, you probably don't remember me. I think it's been about three years since I've been out there. Um, but it was, a, I've been out there several times, but you let me, and where you're sitting in that room uh, is, I know your smoking room. And so I brought a couple friends with me and, you know, middle of a absolute freeze and uh, met several great people back there. Um, but what's the, what's the culture outside? Because the other time I was there was in the fall and they were having the, um, yeah, the cannabis celebration over there. And I remember you warning me, you're like, you can go out and sit on the bench outside and smoke, but if you walk across the street, you will likely be fined. Is that still the same out there? Or is it getting any better? Well, <clears throat> technically, technically you're not supposed to smoke in the park. But the mayor of Boston, who is now the labor secretary, uh, no comment on that. But the, the mayor of Boston told me if you're, if you're stupid enough to give your ID to a park ranger, you deserve a ticket. I have, I always smoke in the park, and no one's ever even asked me for my ID. So mm, okay. I would say, yeah, we got a, we have our share of ultra liberals here, if you know what I mean. But essentially, in this establishment, you can do what you want. And we just ignore them. I mean, you realize, though, of course, that I have to have a special license. It cost me, I think, I don't know, six or eight hundred dollars a year just so I can smoke in my own store. But it is what it is. You know, it's better than the alternative because it would be very difficult to be designing tobaccos for people and not be able to taste them. So, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I mean, I just have to say, you know, it was always great being in your store and getting a chance to talk to you or one of your associates in there. Um, you helped me early on in my smoking career, so it was good. Thank you. Steve, another question in here from a YouTube group about shipping. Do you ship internationally or only inside the U.S.? No, we ship everywhere. Okay. Super. So, um, um, <clears throat> Sorry, I <laughs> just inhaled down the wrong tube. <laughs> um, so you're sitting in um, your smoking room. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about how your whole store is is uh, set up? And yeah, we don't have a smoking room. This is the blending room, but I let guys smoke up here when I'm not blending because I've never been a. I don't believe in smoking lounges. I think it only is bad for business for a lot of reasons. But uh, I do think guys can smoke it, smoke a cigar, smoke a pipe if they're here. But this is primarily, this is, this is the blending room. But this, this is the, the furthest back part of the store. If you want, I can have a Nate show you around the store. Because yeah, it. well, so I thought maybe we'd start right there in the blending room and maybe Nate can sort of do a little walk around and, you, and you could you're in charge you, and do a little narrative of what we're looking at well i'll have you narrate and i'll uh, okay all right yeah, that's hey Nate. hey how are you so i just got to figure out how to turn the screen around the other camera 
Maybe not. Maybe I'll just go this way. So that obviously that's the bench. The thing about the bench is what I'm most uh, stringent about is non-aromatics on the left side, aromatics on the right. You make that mistake, you're in big trouble with me. <laughs> because, you know, especially guys that smoke non-aromatics, it's, it's surprising that the tiniest bit of aromatic can infect the blend, and I don't want to be accused of uh, having adulterated blends. However, I'll tell you a story about that. Many years ago, Bob Peretti was up here blending tobacco, and uh, we sent off the tobacco, and we got a phone call from a guy who said he found a wedding ring in the tobacco, and it was Bob's wedding ring. So sometimes you might find a piece of gold in there. And then, uh, you know, we keep tobacco over here. We're a little blown off, but there's more tobacco downstairs. Usually we keep about two tons of tobacco here. Some place or another. This is an antique cutting machine here. We still use to cut the flake. This is also the cutting machine where Bob already cut part of his thumb off, but they put it back. And there are presses here and there are more presses downstairs. And, you know, there are scales and, and all that. The usual stuff you can cut. You can show them what the blend books make. <clears throat> You can see how old they are. They're all handwritten and uh, go back. So I'm assuming that these were originally bound books that have just yeah, are just so old. Bound, they're falling apart. Yeah. That's why I keep them in the safe. But here's Ramsey McDonald of Great Britain and the premier of Canada. And that we've had a, we have had a lot of these illustrious types who have been in here. His blend we still make. That's from 33. It's it's one of the well, it's not the oldest, but it's been popular since 1933. So whose handwriting are we looking at? Is that, is that Bob's then? No, that wasn't Bob's. That's before Bob. That might have been his father's or one of the people who worked here. And somewhere in the archives, I have a release from Ramsey McDonald saying it's all right to sell his private blend to the public. Nate, show him around downstairs. You didn't narrate. Didn't you? Okay. Hey, th thanks, Steve. We'll we'll be back to you in a in a minute. Now we have our correspondent, Nate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is this me? Yes, sir. Okay, just give me a minute. I want to see if I can switch the camera to the uh, other direction here. Mike Barum. There we go. Right. All right. Mike Barum. So uh, we'll go back to the script. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to test the Wi-Fi. We'll go outside for a second and uh, show you the uh, coming in from outside. So again, just really quickly for those people who um, haven't figured this out already, uh, this is a the first in a series of um, Pipe Club meetings that we hope to have in 2021 that visit our uh, existing brick and mortar tobacconists and pipe shops all around the country. And we're starting with maybe the, the best one of all is LJ Peretti's in Boston. And we're getting a virtual tour. Uh, as we get this tour, I'll pause every so often for you guys to ask questions about it. But this is really extraordinary. I've never been to this shop, although I've been to Boston a ton of times. I don't know why I've never been to this store before. And I'm getting my first look at it. So this is really a treat. Um, so, uh, Nate, I'm going to turn it back to you and you can sort of just tell us what we're looking at. Okay, absolutely. I'm going to, uh, go outside. I think the Wi-Fi should reach like so the storefront. So much for the Wi-Fi. I don't know if Nate can still hear us, but uh, yeah, your Wi-Fi dropped there. Uh, you're looking at a picture of the sidewalk in front of LJ Peretti. Yeah, just just to the right of this, since I've been there, is actually where the bench is uh, that you can sit and smoke. Yes. 
while we're waiting for that to come back, Tim, Tim Hynek, do you want to talk a little bit about <laughs> what the front of the store looks like? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would suggest everybody go on to the website and see some pictures, but it's just this really, um, you know, just a nice old old style tobacco shop. And, you know, around it are, you know, you have, you know, the more, you know, modern kind of things, uh, you know, in the whole area. But when, when you look at the Peretti store from the outside, you can just tell this is an old school, you know, store that's been there you know, for a really long time, you know, like right across the street, there's a big, you know, fancy hotel and up the street, there's, you know, the restaurants and stuff and there's the theater district, but it stands out really just as, you know, this very warm, welcoming kind of place. If you like tobacco and you go in and you saw what the inside looks like, you know, it's just, it's really, it's great on the inside. It's really, you know, it's all very old. I mean, the building's very old and charming and I, you know, you can never, I don't think you could ever duplicate that setting. Okay, I got Nate back again there. So now, Nate, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Sorry about that. That's all right. Tim, Tim filled in for you. Gave us a good. All right. So hopefully you can see a little bit of the storefront. I guess that was a bit too far from the Wi-Fi, but uh, yeah, coming in, we've got um, we have every square inch that you could fill with uh, cigars and pipes here, and. Uh, more cigars in this direction. But of course, you guys are all here for the pipes. We were talking about Costello's earlier. We got a great collection of Costello's, other Italian uh, Italian pipes. Yeah, so Nate, I'm gonna ask you for yeah. a favor. Um, sure. Just like linger on your display cases there. You know, don't, sure. don't have to talk slowly, but you know, I, we'd love to take a good gander at, at all the good stuff you got there. Yeah. Well, we've got Costello's, Dunhill's. And uh, other good Italian high grades. And uh, in a bit, I'll introduce you to Nate Johnson. He's our in-house pipe maker. He does really beautiful work, some real creative and far out pipes as well. And uh, he's here working with a buddy of his in the basement today. So I can introduce you to him. How many pipes do you think you keep in inventory? Jeez, uh, thousands at least. If I guess, I would, I would have to guess close to 10,000. I mean, they're not all out. But it, like in store? Yes. Wow. Yeah. We have a lot, you know, a lot of stock downstairs as well. And uh, we have our wall here. See that picture? And all these are for sale. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're here for. We're going to say hi to uh, this is Steve Gilboard. He's been here for what, 20 years now? Nine years. Nine years. And uh, <laughs> one, another wonderful, very knowledgeable smoker. Uh, knows all about cigars. Easier as well as pipes. Emotions. You've got, you know, of course, your accessories, ashtrays, meerschaums, uh, a couple of pipe racks made by uh, Charles Campioni up in Maine. I don't know if he's part of this group, but I see him online quite a bit. We have a comment from one of our uh, YouTube members uh, over there from Australia with typical Australian sense of humor. It says, pity you don't have many pipes in stock. Right. <laughs> no, we, got, we got pipes. And then, of course, you know, cigars are a, a huge part of the business as well. And then we have our tobaccos. Um, bulk blends are available here. We've got the yellow, the, our signature yellow cans behind uh, the scale and um, hundreds and hundreds of tin tobaccos to choose from. If we don't have it, we can probably get it. 
and of course the scale itself, which was what I was most most excited to work with when I started. This was uh, this is from 1802. Uh, there were only two of them made. Uh, the uh, the twin to this scale is in the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. Mm -hmm. But this has weighed literally thousands of tons of tobacco out. Hey, Nate, I got a question. Do you guys have fire insurance? Absolutely. <laughs> is it more than normal? Uh, that I don't know. I don't think so. Is fire insurance more than a normal policy? I don't know. We just pay a lot of insurance. <laughs> <laughs> we do. But uh, yeah, so here's our, uh, you know, the, the 80 or so blends that are regular uh, blends that we have here. All right, are you going downstairs? Yeah, we'll head down and uh, we'll say hi to Nick. Before you run downstairs, I just have one yeah. quick curiosity question. Sure. Do you have any, what would I call them, celebrity pipes that have come back to the store? You mean pipes that belong to a celebrity that may have come back? Yeah. I and don't think so. A wall of fame is what I was curious about because you've got such a fantastic display of everything else. I was just curious. Well, I don't think we've ever had a Peretti pipe come back. We've had Dunhill's come back. We've had Sheridan's. We've had Costello's. But I don't think we've had a Peretti pipe come back. You see them on eBay once in a while, especially the ones that Bob carved. He was famous for his fan pipes. The big plateau of briars laid out and the rough top of the Abishan on top. You see those occasionally, but no, I don't collect that stuff. I sell it. Gotcha. But before we go downstairs, let me just open it up to any questions that the guys might mm -hmm. have about the, the front of the store before we go in the back. Um, so that you, if you want you to turn around or something like that, that you can do that. But uh, guys, go ahead and just jump in. Uh, do you do any any online trading also? I would uh, love to, you know, buy something from your uh, place. How do I do that if I want to? Sure, you can either give the store a call. Um, we have a 1-800 number on the website or you can order right online at uh, ljperetti.com. And uh, if you're overseas, okay. uh, if you're overseas and there's a problem, you know, the website says it's best to verify addresses. If there's ever an issue, just send us an email or give us a call and we can finalize the order over the phone for you. That's a fabulous. Hey, Nate or Steve, how long have you been in that location? 1938. Since 1938. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of this stuff is original. So, so here, to... oh, go ahead. So, no, it was just, we have all, all, all sorts of uh, memorabilia here. It's, it's a half a museum as well as a store. Yeah, so I was I was going to ask, you know, in terms of odd things. So I just bought a, a Bing Crosby thermostatic pipe, which has a unique filter hole system on the stem. Um, do you do you have anything old like that that floating around in the back that you'd uh, you don't even realize might be back there that you'd be looking at? Because I'm looking for more of those filters. Uh, I mean. May not even be aware of what they are. No, I know what they are. Uh, okay. I wouldn't have them because you're going to think this is terribly elitist, but that's the way it is. I don't like to sell pipes with filters or metal in them because I think they're counterproductive to a good smoke. So, okay. I mean, I, I have some, you were talking, we were looking at that golf ball pipe in the beginning, one of the gentlemen have, and I have some German pipes like that that are no longer made, but they, they don't. They're not filtered like that. The only filtered pipe I sell is designed Berlin and uh, rusticated and smooth, and we keep those. Under normal circumstances, there are a lot of European tourists here, and they like that. But of course, now that we're moribund, uh, we don't see them very often. Yeah. But yeah, your no, store. It's a, it's a unique pipe that I have. I mean, it's not, yeah. I don't know. No, no, I, no I understand. But I, yeah. I don't have anything exactly like that. I think. You know, I, I had some uh, Brigham pipes, and I had some had Kirstens over the years, things like that. But uh, what you're talking about, I've never, I've never actually had one. Okay, so your store is one of the oldest stores in the country, correct? The second oldest in the country. Yeah. Wow. And is that under consecutive like family um, ownership, or just different um, people have bought into the company over the years? 
Well, it's duration of the store. I mean, until I bought the store, it was all Paredes. Uh, Iwan Reese has changed many times also. I think, I, as I say, I think they're two years older, but we don't quibble about this. And uh, <laughs> no, it's a duration of the actual store founding. Our, ours was 1870. So, awesome. Uh, first of all, what pipe are you smoking, Steve? Uh, I switched for you guys. I'm smoking a great line, uh, a, not a great line, I'm smoking a Costello Fiamata. Nice. I have to. Uh... I know sometimes if uh, we have some new fellows who haven't been um, in the Zoom room before, uh, the best way to ask your question is is with boldness and courage. Just jump in and, and spit it out. You'll take right, over I'll, the Zoom screen and, and everybody will hear you. I'll jump in for a quick second here. I have the good fortune of living just outside the Boston area. And uh, Steve's shop is amazing, as you can see, and his knowledge is bountiful. And if uh, you're ever visiting um, the Boston area, this isn't a plug for him or anything like that. It's just a, it's one of a kind. And uh, I believe it's in the old Park Square section. And uh, walked by it a million times. It's been smoking a pipe for 40 years, and and uh, started going in about 15 years ago. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's, it's spectacular. Thank you very much. Um, Maybe this, uh, I'll just give the comment that came over on YouTube and then we can start going downstairs if you want. Um, somebody says, I might have missed it, but is there a way to rent a room in the back of your store? <laughs> just wants to go and live with you. Um, so, I, yeah, let's go downstairs, take a look at the pipe room. Okay. Watch your step, you don't fall. All right. Don't, uh, don't judge us too harshly. It's an old building, and uh, a lot of this stuff is, is original. But um, we do make, our, make pipes here, repair pipes here. And on the way down, I'm just going to show you our walk-in humidor. Um, most of our display upstairs is in, uh, is in uh, cases, you know, wall cases, but we have a heck of an inventory down here in are in the, uh, the store area. Yeah, I, I probably should have cautioned them that walking into the humidor would cut off the Wi-Fi as well. <laughs> um, so Nate, come on back there, brother. Think of all the great stories we're missing out on right now as he's talking to us. I know, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah. By the way, uh, when it comes back, uh, chatting with Steve um, over the this last week while uh, we're prepping for the for the meeting today, he said, "I've got a million and one stories." So I don't think we teased out even like the tip of the iceberg from him. So. Um, Maybe we just need story time with Steve. We do need story time with Steve. So yeah, I would just like like ask him some questions about random stuff and I'm pretty sure he'll have a story about it. I like that it says um, English pipes and then European pipes. I guess they changed that after the Brexit. <laughs> All right, there's, there's Nate back again uh, in the right. shop there. So, Nate, can you hear us? I can, yep. Okay, can there we me? go. All right. So, um, this is Nick Johnson. Hey, how are you? Yeah. He's our uh, in-house pipe maker. Does a lot of the work you see upstairs on, uh, on his custom pipes, and if you ever repair, you know, we'll get to it pretty quickly. I'll do my best for you. My main product is sawdust, though. That's oh, what I make the most of. Can we see what you're working on today? Sure, yeah. Uh, this, I got the stem on the lay though there, so I don't want to unchuck it yet, but this is, you know, gonna be a nice dub one. Sorry. And this one's coming out so pretty. 
Super. Nate, can you sort of close in on him? Now, be careful. Mask yourself up there. But uh, yeah. That's right. Wow. Yeah, this is just coming out really pretty. Nice gray. It, oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Do you it's know what color stain time. you're going to put on that bike yet? No, I don't know, honestly. I started out with a black undercoat, uh, non alcohol based, and I sanded it off so you get that really gorgeous tiger stripes. Um, and I might do orange or I might do kind of a, ma a reddish mauve pinkish color or I might just go yellow I even thought about just going plain old natural I just haven't decided yet is that one and I got this one in the works too this is fun I've had a lot of fun doing this one. Oh wow isn't that great it's just a gorgeous bulldog you can't see the grain uh, but that stem is amazing it's kind of fantastic yeah, the, the grain on this is just so pretty. Yeah, that's what I was looking at, the stem too. Yeah. It's really, it's gonna have some nice straight grain to it. I'm not sure it'll get the straight grain stamp, but it might. We'll have to see when it finishes out. How many uh, uh, pipes a day do you turn out? A day, God. Uh, it's more pipes a week. Well, that's kind maybe. of what I thought, but I thought I would push it. Yeah, no. Uh, if, I, if I'm, if I work, you know, I, I work here only a couple of days a week, honestly. So it's two or three pipes, maybe every two or three weeks. Got it. So we have a uh, question that came up right away on the, um, on the YouTube over here. How do we get one of your pipes? And I, the, the answer is kind of obvious, but I'm going to let you say it anyway. Well, sure. Yeah. You just call Steve or you go to the website um, and, you know, we do custom orders too. If there's something you particularly have in mind, uh, I'd love to talk to you about it and we'll get it taken care of. Yeah. Nick's done custom, uh, custom pipes for, for hundreds of customers by now. Packed up here. Yeah. Everything's, you know, he really puts a lot of thought into the design. Everything's very clever and unique. Yeah. 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 I did a neat pipe. Did you show him my spy pipe? I have not yet. No, oh, I think we'll, we'll follow you up. My spy, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you'll indulge me. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but as they're walking up, I can smell the dust on oh. the. On the this dust is original to the building. <laughs> hey, we just saw the mirror, his mirror pipe. Is that possible to see that? What's that? I'm sorry. We just saw his mirrored spy pipe on the website. Is that possible to, to see that oh, yeah. person? That's the one he's, he's pulling out for you. Oh, it is. Oh, cool. Here's uh, here's some more of his pipes here. Uh, my unbreakable pipe. The one with the spring. Yeah. Uh, so, so this pipe here, when I was making it, I dropped it, and the, the shanks cracked, and I was so teed off. I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do it. So I put some <laughs> tubing in there, put a spring on it. It's been tested. It's not going to break and you drop it. <laughs> that is a great design. Oh, yeah. This is my uh, fly fishing pipe. Oh. Got some cork for flies, some leader right here. It's, it's nice olive wood, too, so it won't even hurt getting wet. And a little lanyard clip here, too. So, you know, when you hook into the big one, you're like, yeah, and it falls. It's not Can in the water. Look at that one. <laughs> yeah, well, we need to see that one up close. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, wow, that is neat. Yep, this, this spins so you can pull it off whenever you need it. That is neat. cork from a wine bottle we had somewhere. Do you sell, sell replacement cork for that? Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how we do it, but we'd figure it out. Is, is Steve nearby? 300. 
Uh, yeah, just a second. No, I, I'll, I have a comment to pass along to him, but it doesn't have to be right this second. Okay. Why didn't you ask to see that? Here's the spy pipe I was talking about. This is made so when you're trying to observe someone covertly, slide this panel back and it's got a little mirror, and you can smoke it and look behind you. <laughs> <laughs> and it hides when you want to be inconspicuous. <laughs> I'm assuming that's also if you're in the park where they have a no smoking ordinance right. yeah. and you're and you want to make sure you don't get busted. Right. That right. is a cool pipe. This, this here is my uh, my pocket church warden. With this pipe here, you can see the shanks really wide. So I drilled it up this way, over, down, over, and back in. And then I plugged the sides up. So it's got a length of a pipe that's actually about that long. Well, I guess that long. So you can see better. I apologize. <laughs> wow. I've been telling you what she said. She said no. You're not saying any longer. Let's see. Oh, yeah. My seahorse. I love this shape. It's just a pretty shape. I think, I think Bonor did this shape originally. Uh, it wasn't quite like this, but I just love it. And we live near the ocean. Um, and as a born Midwesterner, I'm fascinated by it and just adore it. Beautiful grain on that pipe. Oh, yeah. This block really worked well for it. Jeff, where do you get your briar? Uh, well, you know what? A lot of the briars has been in the shop since the 1950s. So I don't know. I believe we still have the records of where it came from. But um, it's all briar. It's been here for ages. So let's pause for just a second because I, I want to make sure that everybody and, you know, those of you who watch this in the future really pick up on what he's just saying. So Jeff is making Peretti pipes Nick. in Nick. the store from briar that is 50, 60 years old and has been there for a long time. And so you're getting, a, getting the kind of pipe made from materials you can't get anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, is the, this is the same age as when they were making dead root pipes for Dunhill. Wow, that's awesome. Oh, it's, it's fabulous to work with. It's a little, it darkens up over time. So you don't get the bright, well, you know, you've seen those natural bright yellow pipes, like the one downstairs. That was actually a newer block that I had. Uh, I picked up that, I don't know when, recently. Um, but you can't get that with the older briar. On the other hand, the older briar ages so well. It's that deep, rich, russet color. It's just gorgeous and wonderful to work with. It smells like a green. We have a question about, um, can you tell us where, for those who people who don't live in Boston and, and whatever, but might come and visit, like what part of the town, where do we go to find your shop? Well, if you, I mean, you can't miss it, honestly. The Boston Commons, the big park that everyone talks about, you see in the movies, it's across the street. So we are right in the middle of Boston. Um, if you find the Commons, you can find us. There's a statue of Edgar Allan Poe, actually, right out in front of our building. Um, so, you know, if you're in the Commons and you still can't find it, just look for Edgar Allan Poe or ask someone where that is. We're on the corner of Boylston and Charles. Charles, Charles. Please forgive me. I, I live up on the North Shore. And I come into town for Peretti's, and that's really about it. Awesome. You should, add, you should add that the, the old briar that Nick is using at the moment is all Algerian briar. You can't get Algerian anymore. So it's truly a rare commodity. We should actually be charging twice as much for the pipe, especially with Nick's craft. Thanks, Bob. Super. So while we're here with Jeff with us, uh, gentlemen, Nick. Um, anybody? Nick, sorry. I don't know why I said that. Because um, I'm old, that's why I said it. Um, if you've got some questions for him, just jump in with your questions there. Yeah, yeah. What's the craziest shape you've ever made? The craziest shape I've ever made? <laughs> <laughs> I've had some custom orders that may not be uh, safe for work. Uh, I made a... <laughs> I made a butt pipe. And I had this briar, I made a nice billiard with it, but it had this flaw right there. So I just took my file and I carved this groove into it to follow the shape. I'm like, that looks like a butt. So 
Yeah, that's probably my, my uh, crazy spike. Uh, I like making ballerinas. Uh, that's my favorite shape. We don't have one handy, uh, but I'm sure you can look it up on the internet. They're just beautiful, this gorgeous curving arch with the, the bird's eye on the top of the bowl. It's beautiful. This was fun. This was, uh, who is it? Go no, 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 not Kogan. Magritte. Magritte? Yeah. You know, this is not a pipe. This is a pipe. The famous, what was it? Surrealist. Mm -hmm. uh, I ask where you learned to make pipes. Pardon me? Where did you learn to make pipes? I'm mostly self-taught. Where did you learn to make pipes? Yeah, mostly self-taught. Um, when I was in college, I started working at a smoke shop in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and I just loved the pipes, but I couldn't afford them. And, you know, I grabbed the block of briar and I just started chipping away at it. And that's where it is. Uh, I got a heck of a lot of tutelage, I suppose, uh, from a guy named Roland Schwartz, who was a German pipe maker in, um, in the mid 90s. He was just an amazing craftsman and he was so generous with his time with me, uh, emailing back and forth, God, sometimes three or four times a day. Uh, I've also had advice from folks like Trevor Talbert, Kyler Lane, uh, John Crosby. These are guys I hung out on the Pipe Smoke Pipe Makers Forum with. And we just traded ideas back and forth and advice back and forth. Um, I think I've only had one other pipe maker in my shop or been in their shop. Uh, well, uh, well, actually, Brad Pullman stopped by here. That was just kind of a visit. Uh, um, Kel Sorensen, Red Hat Pipes, spent an afternoon with me in my workshop one day in the, uh, when he was in town for the Columbus Pipe Show. But mostly it's just learning by myself. Hey, once again, um, younger, <clears throat> just, um, just to make sure that everybody is really, um, like you don't need my permission, but I'm, I'm encouraging you guys because I, I know that you, we always end up a uh, pipe meeting and people are like, oh, I should have asked. Blah, blah, blah. So go ahead and, and uh, launch your questions out there. Um, we do have one, I'll get it all started here from YouTube. This is, what's the story on the left and right leaning pipes on the website? <laughs> oh, those are great. So, you know, I made those in, um, late October, early November, and they're for the election, honestly, because, I mean, you, know, you got your Republican who's bright red and it leans to the right. And of course you got your Democrat fight, which is blue and leans to the left. And they're both welcome here. Absolutely, absolutely. The Americans are nuts. You know that, don't you? <laughs> I thought about making a purple one for the center. Super. Being mixed step. Thanks very much. First. You did very well putting this. Awesome. I tell you, the, the, one of the hardest things about pipe, which hardly, well, I mean, unless you've done it, you might not think about it, but the hardest part about pipe making is almost always the stem. Work. The stem is really, it's the interface between the smoker and the pipe. And so you can have a gorgeous piece of briar, well seasoned, should smoke well, but if you've got a crappy stem, it's, you know, it's never going to be your favorite. It's going to sit on the rack until it gets dust on it. And eventually you'll get rid of it. The stem work is as important or more important than getting the right block. You can get an average block, have a fabulous stem to it, and it'll be your favorite. You reach for it time and again. You won't even know why. It just feels good in your mouth. Um, and it really is, it's where I spend most of my time too. You know, I love doing the silly stuff, with, you know, <laughs> the beer and all that stuff and the shapes and the grain and the staining. But the stem work is just the critical piece. Uh, it is the most important part of a pipe. Uh, uh, as far as materials go, you know, there are adherents to uh, 
people who say blue site's the best and vulcanite's the best. They're both terrific, they're both fine. Working with them requires a little bit of different treatment because vulcanite is usually a little softer, a little more forgiving, uh, whereas the blue site is, is significantly harder uh, and it's harder to work with. It, it polishes up much better and keeps that polish. So it depends on what you're interested in for them. Either way, the stem work is, is, in my opinion, the most important part. Awesome. It's interesting. Um, combination stem, something like this, like uh, this mushroom that I did, it has combination stem, uh, briar, and uh, lucite together. Oh, do I ever, yeah, put the, do I ever use briar or lucite and vulcanite together? Occasionally, yeah. Mostly as accent pieces. Uh, but, you know, at that, at the junction where, zero, zero where your mouth is, you can't. Because if you try and put those two pieces together, you're gonna to have to glue them. And eventually the heat in your mouth and the pressure of uh, just holding it is gonna weaken that glue, that joint, and it's gonna snap. So yeah, up here, it's fine. I do that all the time. But you know, it's gotta be one or the other at the top. Or bottom. Yeah, well, actually uh, uh, on the top, I prefer either vulcanite or loose tight because it's much more durable. And uh, I've seen uh, pipes with the uh, full uh, briar stems, and usually they don't last longer than. Yeah. So, but a combination like this, Master Berendi, I have now, I love it. I just love how it looks. And oh, yeah. uh, the, uh, this uh, top of the stem is a pure lucite, but it has a vulcanite, uh, I, I mean, a briar uh, uh, connecting to the shank. Oh yeah, the accent pieces are really Wait, fun to do. Oh yeah. When he puts his hand on it, it looks good. Well, shall we? Uh, shall we let Nick go and see if we can um, spend a little more time with uh, with Steve before he has to jet off there? Sure. sure. I was going to. I was going to ask Nick what his favorite. Uh, what What's your favorite blend? My favorite blend. Brown rope, down with and hold up brown rope. Love that stuff. I'm mostly a cigar guy. I do a lot of cigars just because it's more convenient down in the shop. Uh, but, you know, as far as pipe dip tobacco, I love the rope. Okay. It's been Thank hard you. these last couple of months. I'm sure you guys know it because we couldn't get it. But, oh, when we can, it's just wonderful. This year. Well, Nick, thank you very much. It's been um, uh, just a treat to, to get to Absolutely. meet you and, and uh, find out who's making the pipes there at Paredes. And My whatnot. pleasure. Stop um, in when you're, you know, when you're in town, stop and ask if I'm here. I'd love to take you down to my shop personally and show you around. Uh, I have a couple guys who come in here that I'm kind of all right, teaching them how to make pipes. There are not enough pipe makers in the world. If you're here, come on, let's share, let's share some notes. Let's uh, get together. Well, I know that we've got a few... Uh, pipe makers in the club group <laughs> so you be careful what you ask for you might get a bunch of bunch of guys coming in and i i have a feeling that you're going to get some orders for that uh, fisherman's pipe i just have a i just have a sneaking suspicion we need to make more or that one if you guys let me know i'm happy to do it absolutely love it super pleasure talking to you nice talking to you too um yeah, Nate, you wanna, is, if, is Steve still around? Uh, yeah, I've got Steve here, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll bring you back, hang on. I just wanna say a few words. There we go. So first thing, first things first, Steve, this is just- up front, but uh, we're busy today, so we're glad you could see us uh, in action. Yeah. Oh, so this is what I was going to say. First things first, this has been, this is a real treat. And we really want to say thank you for, you know, being so generous with your shop and with your time. This is, this is, a, again, so many comments coming through that, you know, are on the YouTube and also in the, in the chat here on Zoom, just in awe of what we're seeing. So thank you for, for that well, part. Pleasure is ours. Yeah. Um, I do have a comment, though from one of the viewers over there on um, on YouTube. He says, you are 
tell Steve that he is an elitist SOB and I can't wait to grow up to be just like him. <laughs> and that's from Brian Levine. Brian, well, Brian Levine, he should talk. I've known <laughs> Brian a long time. He's a good man. Um, uh, let me jump in. Steve, Steve was kind enough to host the meeting of the Sherlock Holmes Pipe Club, and his hospitality was absolutely unmatched. And, you know, I know Nate gave us a tour of the shop, but if you ever have the chance to get there, uh, it's, it's just... The pictures don't do it justice. It's an amazing, exactly. amazing place. You know, I, I would just like to add, I, I've been going to Paredes for maybe 40 years since I've been in the Boston area. And anytime, every time I walk in that store, it just, it just it has this warm feeling. If you feel like you're home, you feel like you're totally welcome. Oh, I need to go there. And I'm it's just it's a you, great, Tim. great place to be. Great store. I'm going to have to talk up with Tim. And well, to add on to his go. comment about He's a good person. A lot of us, we can all say, and there's so few of us. <laughs> yeah, I never had pleasure visiting the store, but I smoked some of the tobaccos, and they are of highest quality. Thank you. Steve, I have, I have a question for you. You've, you've made so many blends, and I'm wondering, is there is there a blend that you you want to make, but you haven't made it yet because of, I don't know, the scarcity of materials or whatever. Is there any, is there a dream blend that you haven't quite gotten to yet? Well, it's interesting you say that because for the last two months, I've been working on an equivalent to St. Bruno. That's what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, and, uh, you know, I think that St. Bruno is an underappreciated tobacco in general. And I like the taste of it. I don't smoke it all the time, but I think it's a truly distinctive Virginia. And I'm almost there, so I don't know what I'm going to call it, but uh, I'm almost there. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tobacco I would like to achieve, I guess. Nice. Is there a tobacco that you've blended that you never want to blend again? Uh, well... Every year we do a Christmas tobacco, a Yuletide. And I did a, speaking of old formulas, I did one it was called Yuletide 1953. And we sold a ton of it. And people still ask for it. I try to tell them that limited edition tobaccos are only for that year. But usually if I know the guy, I weaken, but I don't, I like to keep limited editions, limited edition. So I say with that Yuletide 53, which didn't start off to be a Christmas blend, but it became one is one I don't like to make because one of the tobaccos in it is in very short supply. And I, I just don't like blending it, I guess. That's, that would be the one. But the others are... Oh, oh, oh. No. Uh, Steve, I have another question for you. Unless it's a trade secret, where do you source your tobaccos from for blending? Well, we source them from a lot of places, but because our Burleys, because I make such large quantities, uh, there are two of my Burleys that I have Sutliff make for me, and they have a blender oh, there that was excellent. I wouldn't trust the tobacco, the, the, the formulas with anyone else because we've had experiences in the past where people have actually tried to steal blends. But Sutliff, in, I mean, I, I can't speak to their regular tobacco, but in terms of the Burleys they make for me, I mean, we buy hundreds and hundreds of pounds a year. The tobacco is excellent, so I would say Sutliff. But we get tobacco from everybody. I mean, uh, even uh, Craig Tarler, we gave him a uh, formula for uh, one of our blends years ago. And so now uh, Laudisi is making, it's not for the blend, but one of the ingredients and Laudisi makes that, but I get tobacco from everybody. Depends on the price. Like I'm having, there are big problems with Perique now, as you may or may not know. And so I try to, I mean, I'm picky about my tobacco. So I get my, I try to get the best Perique that I can and I've had to go to other sources, but it's, it's about the quality of the tobacco. Of course, when it's here, we change it anyway. We blend it or we cure it or we press it or we cut it. But I have a number of sources for tobacco. Uh, and uh, do you use any whole leaf tobacco or you already get like uh, cut tobacco? The only whole tobacco? leaf tobacco I get is we have one, two, three or four blends that use cigar leaf. And Carlos Fuente is 
a close friend of mine. He's a godfather of my daughter. So I only use his cigar leaf and whole leaf. And I sometimes I cut it, sometimes I have him cut it, but it's the highest quality leaf that goes into those blends. Oh yeah, you know, Carlito, Carlito has amazing tobacco, that's for sure. <laughs> well, he's got more tobacco than you, I mean, this is most, it's his cigar tobacco, but he, I have been personally in about 15 warehouses the size of football fields full of tobacco. And not just Dominican and Nicaraguan tobacco and Honduran. There are whole warehouses of pre, pre Castro Cuban tobacco there. So if he ever decides to use the, the Cuban tobacco, he's the man that's ready. Thank God we have a good relationship. I have a question that came over from the YouTube group, um, specifically about Burleys. It says, uh, What would you recommend, Steve? He says, I like my Burleys strong and flavorful. What, what would you suggest he buys? I would say start, well, there are a number of them, but I would start if you want, I mean, I assume he doesn't want a Burley with Latakia or anything. So I would start with either BPC or 333. Those would be the, the strongest Burley. We can make them stronger, but they're, they're, they're pretty strong. So They have a high nicotine content. I mean, yeah, they'll I was, satisfy them. I was gonna recommend the 333 because Tim had the courtesy of giving me 10 of your blends this Christmas. And he gave me the three through three and it was amazing by itself. So thank you to both of you. Oh, thank you. No, three, three, three is an old blend we've had for I don't know, maybe 60 years. And it's got two kinds of burley in it. And it, it has a nice sweetness of the burley that is more complex than the BPC. It's a little added, a little added note of sweetness. It's not a full aromatic or anything like that, but you can, you can taste a little bit more sweetness in it. I got a question for you, um, uh, Steve. So you've been in, in the shop about 40 years, uh, or 50 years in, the, in, in that? Well, off and on. I mean, off I and on? Here. I haven't been here 50 years, but off and on. You know. So uh, when you're in any single location or any, any business, um, there are days that are just, there, there are days that run together. They're like uh, same business every day, same blending, same whatever. And then there are days when things are, uh, are so weird, a, a, a customer comes in from Japan or uh, somebody comes in and, and up, up ends the whole store. And I'm just curious about your stories about uh, those unusual days. Well, there, are, there have been a lot of days like that. I mean, the one that comes to mind most particularly is uh, Steve Tyler from Aerosmith is a customer here. And I can remember he came in with a whole group one day and uh, we had about i don't know we must have had 12 or 15 freehand pipes that bob already had made and at that time they were three four hundred dollars and they bought them all and i said to steve i said what are you gonna what kind of tobacco do you want he smokes tobacco he says i'm gonna smoke tobacco in mine but the rest of the guys are gonna smoke pot in theirs and i thought my god this is one hell of a sale for pot pipes but uh you know there are there are often, I mean, as I said, during normal times, we have one Chinese customer who comes in once a year and he usually buys 10 to a dozen Dunhill pipes and he argues about the price and he argues back, but he ends up spending retail. But there are, you know, all kinds of weird situations like that. Uh, you know, I mean, I've had, uh, I remember Lauren McCall bought a pipe. I, mean, I wasn't here, but I know that Lauren McCall bought a pipe for Humphrey Bogart. One of the weirdest stories that in my memory is when I was here in the 70s, uh, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemon were standing at the end of the counter in the front of the store smoking cigars, and all these people came in and out, and nobody recognized them, which I found a little odd. Uh, I don't know. The time I was the most nervous in the store is when I waited on Catherine Hepburn, and she was buying cigarettes, but I, just because she was Catherine Hepburn, I was somewhat odd by that. But I mean, there's, there's so many, you know, we're lucky over the course of the years, anybody who passes through Boston who's interested in tobacco, you know, comes in here. So I, I don't know if I could single out any other particular instances. I mean, there's been a lot of large purchases. And I mean, we got a, we have a guy who buys, how much do you buy? Uh, 16 pounds of tobacco four times a year. I have to get ready for him. I have no idea what he does with it, but I know he's a hoarder. He comes with a shopping cart and he takes it away. 
mean, you know, but most stores have instances like that. There are tobacco stores attract eccentric people. I guess I'd leave it at that. Um, now I'm curious about the guy who buys a shopping bag for what kind of tobacco? Is it a special blend or is it focused on? It's not a special blend. It's, it's 432, which is an aromatic Cavendish. He's been smoking it, I don't know, as long as I can remember, but he just, he has to be in four, four pound bags. The only way he'll take it, he doesn't want tins. It, it's, you know, it's just, just the way it is. He's a very, very lovely gentleman, but he's, you know, he, he's odd. He's just odd. Question from the um, from the YouTube group over here, um, and I think also this is probably one that is not a hard question. Do you ship to Washington State? Your website only lists Utah and South Dakota, but what about Washington? Well, I'm going to give you a frank answer. I'll ship wherever you want. If you get caught and we have to pay the taxes, you know, that'll be the last time. But I, as you might imagine, I'm not a firm believer in these ridiculous tobacco laws that have been foisted upon us. So yeah, we'll ship it to you. But it's, as long as you recognize it's half your responsibility as well as half mine. Um, I just, just to make this really clear, Steve is being pretty generous right there by that statement. And so please, if you're gonna order from them, use common sense and caution, because um, that's a pretty awesome generosity that he's extending there. Um, but we'll yeah. ship it. I'll, I'll ship it without a Peretti label. I mean, there's things we can do. Not that I'm out to circumvent the law, but, you know, I'll just leave it. It's supposed to be America, isn't it? I mean, we're supposed to have some rights. We're all over 21 here. I mean, it's, you know. Steve, could you talk a little bit about your Cuban blend? Well, Cuban blend is one of the oldest blends and one of the mis under most misunderstood blends we have. There is a, an infinitesimal amount of cigar leaf, which was originally Cuban and Cuban cigar leaf. And that's why it's called Cuban. But primarily it's a mild blend of eight different tobaccos, primarily Burleys, which is actually, there's no flavoring in it. It's non-aromatic. But because of the mixture of tobaccos, it has a nice natural sweetness from the Virginias. And it's a very, it's a very good mild all day smoke. And I also, I, we use Cuban as a base to a lot of our more complex burly blends because it burns smoothly and evenly, and it doesn't add a great deal of other flavor to tobacco. As I say, there's a slight sweetness to it, but it's a great base tobacco. LJ Peretti's office. I have a question for him. How do you go find out who's making a pipe if you, there's no markings on it? Well, it's, it's, unless it's a distinctive shape, it's almost impossible. There's no markings at all. I can't see it, so. It's a square, just a square block with the aluminum shank and it's blue, like the Nording, and it has a stem like a Nording. Hold well, it up again. It could, well, it could be a Nording that Eric didn't stamp. I mean. Anything's possible with Eric. It depends how many cocktails he's had. But uh, I, I, without some kind of nomenclature, it's, I, I couldn't definitively say. You know, there are some companies that are famous, as you know, for certain shapes, but Nordings are all rather unusual pipes. So I would just be guessing. If you want, you can send me a couple of pictures and I'll take a look at it. You know, email me a couple of pictures. And we'll take a look at it and I'll show it to some other guys and all of our pipes. Steve, I have a quick question. This is Alvin in Austin. Uh, the, I know you've got so many pipes, and I would I would assume that they're just not all listed on your website. Would be the oh. best way just to call your store and ask ask you if you had a particular pipe in stock. Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, that's the, the best way to do it because, well, especially now because uh, at one time we had grosses or a dozen dozen of every shape we sold in every line. But that at that time, we had a small factory outside of Boston where we had these two elder, elderly men who used to make pipes for us, phrase pipes on the machine. They both died. So other than the freehand pipes and the pipes that Nick made, I have to source the pipes. And I, it, it is very difficult to source pipes. You know, like I used to have boxes of pots, boxes of Canadian, boxes of bulldogs. 
you can't get anyone to make standard English shapes anymore. The Italians, the law, I'm mean, not talking about Costello or Radice or Sir Giacomo, they only want to make, you know, very expensive pipes. So it's a real, it's a serious problem. And uh, I have a pretty good inventory, but I, you know, I, if you call for a Canadian, well, you're going to have to tell me the shape and the price, and then we'll, start, we'll look for it. But if you really want something, Nick can make it for you. And actually, you know, like a, he made a giant bulldog for one of my customers recently, and it was 200 bucks with an acrylic stem, which is actually, you know, for a custom-made pipe, is quite reasonable. But the real problem in the pipe business today, I would say, the problem is sourcing pipes. Never mind the briar, it's getting someone to actually make the pipes. It's very difficult. I used to, I like Dublins. It's hard to find Dublins. I mean, pots are, prop, are practically non existent. Guys make bulldogs, but don't put the two lines around them anymore. I mean, and we're a very, naturally, being in Boston, we're a very traditional store. You know, I, I won't mention any names, but I, I have contracted that pipe made from so called American pipe makers. I mean, not single guys. I'm not talking about single gentlemen who make pipes, but from companies that make pipes. And they send me a sample. It looks great. I ordered, I can remember the last time I ordered, a, I don't know, five or six. No, I ordered more than that. I think I ordered 10,000 pipes, 10 shapes. The briar was what I would consider less than satisfactory for what I was paying. And the shapes were all off. So it's, it's very discouraging. But that's my problem, not yours. The short answer is, yeah, call a store and I'll see what I can find. Hey, Steve, is there any update on the the 150-year anniversary Peterson Pipes? There's an update because that was a debacle, yeah, but we're now in our 151st year, and I had, a year and a half ago, I contracted with Peterson to make the 150th anniversary pipe. The, the short of it is the guy who was handling it went off the rails, and everything got screwed up, and the factory never got the order in any event. It's all been cleared up. They should be here by March 1st. They're going to be in two shapes, uh, a large full bent and a, uh, a billiard. They're both going to be military mounts with sterling silver bands with a Peretti logo, and they'll be numbered. And they're going to sell on, for under $200 a piece. The reason I went to Peterson in the past for our anniversary pipes, for the 125th, we used Costello. But... Costellos are beyond the price point of a lot of people. And so I wanted to do something that was more approachable. So they're using a unique finish that they have made for us. And from what I've seen from the internet, from the, from the pictures, they look very good. And some of them are ring grains. So I think everybody should be happy. I should have an actual prototype, I think, next week. But I told them to go ahead. So they, they should be here by the 1st of March. And we'll put them on the website. That sounds great. I was going to ask you about that, uh, Steve. How are you going to be selling them? Are you, will you take pre-orders? Will you just first come, first serve once they go on the website? Yeah, well, I'm not going to take, given the experience I had, I'm not, I'm not taking any pre-orders right now until I have them. When I get them, I'll get them, I'll put them up because, you know, I can have more made. I think I had, a, I think I might have had 100 made, but I can, they've assured me that they can reproduce them rapidly after I get them. And again, there's a problem. I, there's some particular shapes I wanted, and they couldn't get the briar for them. So, I mean, it's not just, I'm not the only one that's having the problem. But uh, I have been assured by the president of Laudisi and the guy that runs the Peterson factory, that they, Laudisi now owns Peterson, but, but, but they will be here by the 1st of March. So they will go up on the website with some fanfare, I might add. And will you call because, them, uh, will you call them, 150th anniversary or 151st yeah, well, well, anniversary? Because, well, it's funny because we had lighters made. We had beautiful cigar cases made that came on time. We made the 150th anniversary tobacco, which was a phenomenal success. And we're going to continue to sell that, which is a matured Virginia. But Carlos Wendy was making the cigars, but due to production problems, we're actually renaming that the 150th and a half. It's going to be a the first time he's ever made a special Opus X for the store. So that'll be coming, I would say, in June or July. And the pipe was supposed to be here, but, you know, just didn't happen. You were talking about um, shipping tobacco, uh, Washington. <clears throat> um, about six or seven years ago, 
when I was smoking cigarettes, I jumped on the internet and I found a website where I could order cigarettes through the mail. Yeah, I guess they were coming from Eastern Europe or something like that. And when I got them, they had a uh, custom sticker on there. And the custom sticker said right on there, you know, no doubt, right on there, it says cigarettes. And uh, uh, I never had a problem. But uh, a couple of months later, I saw an article in the paper by the attorney general and said that the mailing cigarettes is illegal. It is now, yeah. You can't mail cigarettes from state to state anymore. That's right. I have no idea why. I, have, I, I, I understand nothing about these laws. I mean, I understand them, but I don't really comprehend what they're getting at. No, they, said, you got to pay the you got to pay the tax on both ends. Right. Exactly. I mean, they just been, want your money. Right. It's all it yeah. is. They just want your money. Yeah, it's like Canada. I mean, we have a lot of customers in Canada, and. 99% of the time, the tobacco gets through. But I tell them there may be one time it might get seized, but given the taxes in Canada, most guys will, you know, spin the wheel because they'll get through. I got a different question in regards of, with all the years you've been at the shop, do you see any difference between the type of smokers from, let's say, 50s, 60s, 70s, in regards of the ones right now? in terms of buying different tobaccos, liking different pipes? Well, yeah, because a lot of it is driven, <clears throat> excuse me, by the internet. The best example with tobacco is esoterica. For years, I had a closet full of esoterica tobacco because we used to buy it direct. They came to us because we were a reputable dealer and it sat on the shelf. I mean, Penzance, Stonehaven, everything sat. Then it became an internet tobacco and now I have trouble getting it. So yeah, it's all driven by that on the internet. There's no question about that. In terms of the actual clientele, <clears throat> I would say there are more younger pipe smokers now, which is a good thing for the business. You know, and we try to, I, I tell I tell pipes, young guys to come in and buy what we call a basket pipe. They cost $29.95 or even a corn cob. Try a different, few different tobaccos. We, you know, we let them sample them, see what you like. We try to build them up that way. Whereas, you know, our older customers, they come in and I, I want a Dunhill Group 3 billiard. That's all I smoke. Or I want, I'm going to buy another Costello. Or, you know, I wanted this, this Peretti pipe. So they're much more rigid. But the younger, the younger clientele is willing to, 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 uh, to, to kind of try different tobaccos and come around to their own opinion more. They're, 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 like most, most older people, they're not as rigid. But I would say the Internet is the biggest factor that's different from what it was 30 years ago. Thank so you. Just, oh, David, hold on one second. I just want to make a real quick comment, then back to you, sir. Um, so we are at um, approaching the two o'clock hour out here on the, or the one o'clock hour on the West Coast, the nine o'clock hour in London. And this is the time when I gently begin to move us towards the exit doors. We're not there yet. So don't freak out and start to run off. Um, but this is definitely the time to ask the questions that you have not asked yet of Steve um, and, and Nate, you know, if you want to ask him a question. Uh, and, um, and that it goes for you guys over there on YouTube and Facebook as well to just type your questions in. I'll make sure they, I'll try. I won't make sure, but I'll, I'll do my best to get them asked before we go off. Uh, all right, that's all I wanted to say. Dave, back to you. David. I have a question about the uh, esoterica tobaccos. Um, um, we have also the problem uh, in Europe with uh, germane tobaccos, which were produced in the same, uh, from the same people. Uh, and uh, you have mentioned that you have uh, uh, directly ordered them. Do they communicate uh, also not, not with you anymore, or is uh, there a little bit of connection? Oh, I haven't. I mean, I was at the factory. I that was, that was 35 years ago, <clears throat> or 40 years ago, oh. 35 years ago. I don't have any communication with with them anymore since they have a uh, one U.S. distributor, which is Arango, and uh, Arango has only gotten, to the best of my knowledge, one shipment in the last 10 months. 
Now, I buy a lot of tin tobacco from Marengo. So they call me when it comes in, but it's never sufficient. I mean, it's it's just, mm -hmm. it's pandemonium when the esoterica comes in. And somehow the customers seem to know when I got it before I got it, which I don't understand, but <clears throat> there's no rhyme or reason, no. Yes. And my question was more, not not towards, I don't, I don't mind esoterica. I mind about you and your blends and if, well, used to buy like maybe one or two pipes then and just buy their daily tobacco every couple of times a week versus now we are a bunch of hoarders and we have to have a hundred pipes and 3000 tobaccos and things like that or no we have we have always had customers who buy most of our customers buy by the pound which is i prefer that obviously but i would say it's about it's still about the same a lot of guys buy pound, I don't know, the average guy smokes a pound a month. That's the average, what an average pipe smoker smokes. But we have guys that buy much more. And ones who come in the store are more likely to sample, but we, we also send out, some guys order 40, 50, one ounce bags. So that's that's different, but that's over the internet. But I would say that in terms of uh, actual sales, it's about the same and, and the habits are not that different. In terms of hoarding, when we did the 150th anniversary blend, I said to Nate, I said, I can't believe some guys are buying six pounds of a tobacco they've never smoked. But they do. Now, and I, I would never do that. I don't understand that. I would always buy two ounces of, you know, so I could try it. But that's changed. You're right. The hoarding is unbelievable. It's just, I, I, don't, I don't understand that at all. But perhaps it was just because of the fact that you have every other blend available at all times. And this one is like at one minute, once it's done, it's done. Well, like you say, like the that's they, one. Yeah, they might've thought that, but uh, yeah, but maybe they thought that, but I, I thought I made it clear that it was gonna be ongoing, but I mean, it came at a great time for us because we were actually locked down in Boston and Nate and I were here every day shipping and blending because we had so many orders. How many orders do you think we have for that? 400 units. 400 orders easy, which is a lot for a tobacco nobody smoked. Steve, I, I, I wonder if um, maybe just as an educational kind of thing for everybody who's watching, like what's the, the difference? Your shop is one of the longest, maybe the longest, uh, continuously operating blending houses in America, which is going to be a different kind of of source of tobacco than somebody who's only been in business for 20 years or even 40 years. Um, okay. So like, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, first of all, most stores <clears throat> in general, most so-called tobacco stores don't want to make the commitment to tobacco because it's work. <clears throat> Secondly, it's a lot easier them to buy bulk tobacco and put their own name on the can. But so those are two things we've never done. And, uh, so we try to suit the individual taste. That's, that's our, I gotta say that's our motto, but we blend to suit the individual taste. And so we tried to establish that with private blends and, and working with customers over the years. Now, I'm not gonna deny, it's a big pain in the ass sometimes, especially when the guy on the other end of the phone or the text has no idea. It's like reading tobacco reviews. I read tobaccoreviews.com and I see what's said about my tobaccos and I say, what are they smoking? I don't even know what the hell they're smoking. But be that as it may, it's the, I think what distinguishes us is the attention to detail, working with the individual customer and actually blending tobacco, not trying to pass off something that's not yours that you can find in the next state under some other name. Yeah, that's actually what makes your place unique because uh, there are a lot of uh, tobacconists around the country and majority of house blends made by Lane Limited. Right. It's the, it's the, you know, I, I can see why they do it. It's the easy way to go. They got a few jars, they got the tobacco, they throw it in there, they triple the price they paid and they, they sell it. The other thing is our tobacco is blended in small batches. It's all hand blended. So you should never find a stem or any irregularity in the tobacco. I mean, I can't say it's a hundred percent, but we, I strive very hard for that. And uh, then it's packed in tin. We change these tins. I tried to put these in same size plastic tins, I'd say 10 years ago, and it absolutely hit the fan. The tobacco's different, everything's different. 
So these tins are expensive. They cost me almost two bucks a piece. But the thing is to have tradition and stay with it. You know, we updated the label a tiny bit, and even people commented on that. But it's the same, essentially the same label. But it's very important to be consistent when it's something you're consuming. It's like if Heinz ketchup changed that bottle, they got problems. But we try to keep the tobacco and the presentation of the format exactly the same. Real quick That's question I, that I write on the you know I write on the tobacco with a with a sharpie and sometimes they can't read it but that's the way it's always been. Real quick question on that just technically somebody asked about cellaring your tobacco can it be cellared in the tin or should they put it in a mason jar? No, it can be. I mean, the tins they're not vacuum sealed. We never went the vacuum sealed route because we sell mostly in half pounds and pounds. Being that, being having said that, uh, it will stay fresh in the tin. I would say for a couple of years. Now, cellaring is a whole other matter. We don't have to discuss it, but yeah, you can cellar it. But I, I would, I would the tins, the plastic bag in the tins, and the plastic is tight. So I would say it would be fine in the tins for up to three or four years. Awesome. <clears throat> Chris, you mentioned about uh, 150th year of uh, Petersons. What's the kind of a price range do you think that is going to be for the uh, pipes for the 150th year? They're going to be around, I'd say, 185 or 195 dollars, which for a, you know, a pipe of that quality with a sterling silver uh, band and a military push is not. I think that's fair. I would say it's unbelievably cheap. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's what I'm trying to get something for the that most people can, you know, can afford. That was the idea. By the way, Zach, if you're still in there, I saw your question come through. And the only reason why I didn't ask it in the group here is because Oliver and I are, and I are gonna ask that behind the, behind the counter, as it were. Um, all right, last chance, gentlemen, um, to ask your questions. Then I'm going to just give you a quick heads up about next week and then Family time, <laughs> or for Steve, back to work. <laughs> right. Steve, I have a uh, Steve, I have a question about um, Costello pipes. Uh, I know you're a big advocate of it. Can you tell me a little bit um, why you hold them in such prestige and uh, why you should come get one? <clears throat> well, I know that Costello has the best briar in the world. I've seen the briar. I've seen it. I, I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to be there. I know a lot about Costello pipes. Plus the gentlemen who craft the pipes, <clears throat> the detail, the attention to the de to detail is meticulous. But to me, it's always about the briar and how a pipe smokes. I mean, I like to look at grain. I like the way the pipe feels, weight. You know, to me, it's about how the pipe is balanced. That you, the lighter, the better, as far as I'm concerned, because older, denser briar is always lighter if it's well seasoned. Costello, in my opinion, has absolutely the best briar and the best craftsmanship. But I mean, I have plenty of Dunhills that I like too, or in, I mean, I, as I say, I have about 800 pipes. So, but I, I would probably say Peretti pipes and Costello pipes are my two favorite pipes. Great. Costello, Great. I think, is the benchmark for pipes. Period. All right, I'll, uh, I'll be seeing you soon then. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That's awesome. All right, let me. There's never enough time. Um, so, um, Steve, I, uh, just two questions. Number one. What question haven't we asked you today that you that you think that we should have asked you or that you want to leave us with? Well, I think you pretty much covered the spectrum. Uh, I was pleased with the quality of the questions very much. I thought they were going to be much more. What's in this blend? What's in that blend? And I was going to have to say, well, so you're not going to know. But uh, no, I if I could bring one thing across, I guess the summation is that. We strive, we're, we're an old fashioned store, I know, and it seems somewhat antiquated, but we strive to maintain those traditional qualities that have brought us 150 for one years. And we hope that, you know, we, we look for a chance to serve you and we'll do the best we can to satisfy your smoking needs. And the last question that I have is, would you come back again and be our guest again someday? Oh yeah, sure, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, 
So for those of you who are watching, I just want to do a quick wrap up. This, this has been this is like beyond my, um, beyond my hopes about what we're doing with this series of visiting brick and mortar tobacconists and, and pipe shops around the country this year. Um, this has been, I couldn't imagine a better way for us to kick this off. Just, I want to say the obvious, like this is an extraordinary store that um, if you're in Boston or get to Boston or if, you know, if we ever start traveling again, go to Boston and go visit the store. Uh, and in the meantime, get online and order stuff from them online. Um, so thank and you. I should say, but one thing I'm supposed to say is, what is the, uh, you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We have people who do this. Yes, at LJ, at LJ Peretti Co. is our Instagram. And search Facebook for LJ Peretti and we come right up. And the Instagram will have a big thing on the 150th anniversary pipes and they'll be all stickied up, you know. Excellent, excellent. As you guys can tell, Steve runs their social media department. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last thing, next week, please come back and join us again. Next week, we've got Ken Byron. David, from David, before, before you close it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I want go to, mm, I want to you know, personally thank Oliver for having ensured that I'm able to get this uh, club pipe, which I got it about a couple of days ago. And, and I'm really e extremely thankful to Oliver for having uh, got me this particular thing. Oliver's the man. Just got to say, Oliver's the man. All right. Um, once again, next week, Ken Byron from Ken Byron Ventures. Um, with his uh, extraordinary and bizarre blends, I've got one coming. I, I, uh, and so maybe I'll be able to talk about it, which is a blend that he made in, um, in, co in coordination, co in collaboration, that's the word I was using, with Chris Kelly from last week. So they have a special blend that they put together, and so we'll be talking about that. Um, until then... Wash your hands, wear your masks, be safe, whatever you need to do, whatever you need to believe in, but come back again next week. And uh, thank you guys for being here. This is a great idea, David. Amazing, David. Yeah, you guys are awesome. See you guys next week. Okay. Thank you. God bless. Bye. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, team, for bringing Amazing. up. Amazing. Nice pipe, Dimitri. Welcome. Thank you. Good job. Thank uh, you.